So it's, it's wonderful to see all of you uh, in person here at Dartmouth's uh, Nelson A. Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and the Social Sciences. Um, I'm Herschel Nackless. I'm a professor uh, of public policy and government here at Dartmouth. And it's my great pleasure to welcome today's uh, Thurlow um, Gordon lecturer, Commissioner Noah Phillips of the Federal Trade Commission and of the great Dartmouth College class of 2000. Now, given the subject of Commissioner Phillips' talk, politics, markets, and populism, antitrust at the crossroads, it is worth sharing a little bit about the namesake for today's lecture, Thurlow M. Gordon, Dartmouth College class of 1906, uh, who established this lecture in 1976. Gordon was a noted antitrust lawyer. And the Gordon lecture is dedicated to bringing, quote, recognized authorities in some field of law to campus. So we're all very fortunate that along with my colleagues, Joanne Blay and Bob Coates, we've been able to bring such a, quote, recognized authority in the field of antitrust law, no less, uh, to be with us here today. Uh, Phillips is a graduate, uh, again, of Dartmouth College and Stanford Law School. He was sworn in as commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission on May 2nd, 2018. Prior to that, he was chief counsel to US Senator John Cornyn of Texas on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, prior to that, he was a litigator in a number of noted law firms in New York and Washington, DC. So it's hard to imagine a more perfect Thurlow Gordon lecturer than, than our guest today. Just, just two final housekeeping notes. After uh, the commissioner's talk, we'll have a bit of a conversation and then we'll open it up to all of your questions. Um, so so please, please bring them. Um, we'll take questions from all of you. And for those of you watching online, you can submit your questions to Rocky Q&A at dartmouth.edu. I'm told that Rocky Q&A spelled with either and or ampersand will work. Um, so, so please send in your questions. Um, and again, you should all know that, that Commissioner Phillips has been meeting with tons of groups of students and faculty on campus since he arrived last night. Um, so please join me in, in thanking and welcoming him back to campus. So thank you, Professor, Professor Necklace, for that really sweet and kind introduction. Um, and thanks to the Rockefeller Center for having me. I think I'm gonna have to hold it like this, so you'll, you'll forgive me, and also the glasses are fogging up, so you'll forgive me for that too. Um, returning to Dartmouth to lecture is a real honor for me, and, and I just wanna start by saying that I'm humbled by it. I majored in government, and I spent countless hours running around Rocky. I don't know how many government courses I took in this room, but it was more than one. Um, one particular lecture, though, that I listened to when I was an undergraduate seems relevant tonight. So in 1998, then Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division, the Department of Justice, Joel Klein, came to speak about the Department of Justice case from that year against Microsoft. More than 20 years have passed, but that case in particular continues to loom large. The popular attention that it received, the decisions rendered, by the federal courts in DC, and of course, that the target was a large tech corporation. After Klein's speech, my friend Wan Jun Cho, 98, asked him, what was the problem with Microsoft giving away Internet Explorer for free with the operating system, which was one of the key allegations in that case? And Klein responded, free is a curious price. So before I go any further, being a federal trade commissioner obligates me to give the standard caveat, which is what I'm gonna to say tonight is not the view of the Federal Trade Commission, and it's not the view of my fellow commissioners. It's really not the view of my fellow commissioners. <laughs> the Microsoft case was an important event in antitrust history, but a relatively recent one. And to contextualize the legal debates and the populist antitrust politics that we see today, I think we need to go back to Thurlow Gordon's time. So you heard a little bit about him from Professor Nackless. He graduated from Dartmouth in 2006. He went to Harvard Law School. He first served as an antitrust lawyer in the Department of Justice for, I think it was Assistant Attorney General Wickersham, or it might have been A.G. Wickersham. And then he joined the FTC in 1916, one year after the agency was open. Um, he served there for a few years and eventually went on to join a firm which later became Cahill, Gordon, and Rindell, which is still around today. But critically for purposes of this discussion, 
Thurlow Gordon lived through two periods where antitrust was a high profile issue. And those periods together spawned the three laws that are the core of our modern antitrust regime. That history from Thurlow Gordon's time has a lot to teach us about the present day. When a century later, popular and political attention are once again focused on antitrust. My goal tonight is to lay out a little bit of that history and demonstrate why some of the call for reform today, not all, but some, is inconsistent with that history. Antitrust law was then, is now, and should remain about one thing, competition. Its fundamental insight is a free market one, i.e., that the competitive process will secure the greatest benefits to all of us, like lower prices, greater quality, or more innovation. The point of antitrust law is to prevent impediments to competition. In the parlance of the Sherman Act of 1890, restraints of trade. Experience and economics, however, both teach that, left to their own devices, some firms will behave anti-competitively, evading or reducing competition in ways that deprive us of those benefits. For example, like the trusts of old, modern cartels bring together firms to fix prices or divide markets securing to themselves monopoly profits that would otherwise redound to the benefit of consumers. Antitrust law exists to prevent this from happening by prohibiting anti-competitive behavior. Beyond that, however, antitrust lets market forces determine outcomes. Consider the recurring refrain these days of how similar our era is to Thurlow Gordon's, a new gilded age and all of that. I would like to spend some of the time on the history of antitrust and where we are today. Like I said, antitrust is and was about competition. But much of the debate about antitrust today, not all, admittedly, but much, is not. It's not about competition. It is about antipathy toward big corporations. It's about the unsettling nature of new technologies. It is about political power. It is about who should run American companies their owners, or the government. Too often, it is about displacing market forces with regulatory fiat, not permitting them to function. But much of this debate, too much to my mind, is not about competition. How do we get antitrust law in America? Following the Civil War, the US experienced rapid industrialization, economic growth, and technological change. In particular, manufacturing and agricultural production increased, and rail and water transportation became faster and less expensive. The expanding financial sector offered businesses greater access to capital, while accelerated rates of urbanization and immigration supplied a large labor pool. This economic and societal ferment led US businesses to grow and compete across state lines, while a protectionist trade policy insulated them from competition from abroad. Business owners soon realized the higher profits could be had if they could acquire or otherwise join forces with their rivals, and the trusts were born. Sugar, salt, steel, whiskey, and of course, the trust established by the grandfather of the namesake of this center, John Davis and Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company. Concerns from other businesses, press coverage like Ida Tarbell, and political attention soon turned into legal challenges, mostly challenges to the form of organization under state corporate laws. Congress passed the Sherman Act against this backdrop in 1890, barring contracts, combinations, and conspiracies in restraint of trade, and actual and attempted monopolization, albeit not monopoly itself. Monopoly is not illegal in America. The legislative history makes clear that the Sherman Act concerns competition, and, what its and that its proponents, including Senator John Sherman of Ohio, we're concerned about the economic impact that impediments to competition posed, not simply the bigness of companies. They understood the inverse relationship between output and prices, and that trusts and cartels extinguished competition, gaining the ability to limit output and raise prices to American consumers. Senator Pugh of Alabama spoke in support of Sherman's bill, condemning, quote, trusts and combinations to limit the production of articles of consumption entering into interstate and foreign commerce 
for the purpose of destroying competition in production and thereby increasing prices to consumers. The perils of double-sided printing. These legislators also understood what today we call efficiencies, benefits to businesses and consumers that can come from growth and mergers. Senator Sherman proclaimed that corporations, which he called the most useful agencies of modern civilization, quote, ought to be encouraged and protected as tending to cheapen the cost of production. He recognized that, again, quote, when corporations unite merely to extend their business, they are proper and lawful end quote, and have the potential to, again, quote, cheapen transportation, lessen the cost of production, and bring within the reach of millions comforts and luxuries formerly enjoyed by thousands, right, from thousands to millions. His bill, he explained, targeted combinations made with a view to prevent competition, or for the restraint of trade, or to increase the profits of the producer at the cost of the consumer, and not the lawful or useful combination. While the drafters of the nation's first antitrust law were certainly concerned about big companies. And while popular support for legislation depended on antipathy towards some of them, the legislators' focus then, like ours has been and should remain, was on conduct, not size. Bad acts, not bigness, were the source of liability. While the first few years of the Sherman Act disappointed, the government scored a series of victories at the turn of the last century in which the Supreme Court adopted a more aggressive interpretation of the statute. In 1906, the DOG sued Standard Oil, culminating in the Supreme Court's landmark 1911 decision to affirm liability and the lower court's order to break up the company. Although the outcome of Standard Oil confirmed the Sherman Act's potency and dismantled the trust that, above all, inspired the law, it also fueled support for additional legislation. The Supreme Court rejected the DOJ's position that the Sherman Act condemned every conceivable contract or combination which could be made concerning trade or commerce. It held instead that the law reached contracts and combinations restraining the free flow of commerce and tending to bring about the evils, such as enhancement of prices, which were considered to be against public policy, not those entered into or performed with the legitimate purpose of reasonably forwarding personal interest in developing trade. This outcome stoked concern that federal judges would have too much discretion to decide what conduct was illegal and that they would move too slowly. In 1914, President Woodrow Wilson called for legislation to bring greater clarity and certainty to antitrust. He also endorsed the creation of a trade commission empowered to review business practices and advise companies of their lawfulness. Ten months later, Congress had passed and President Wilson had signed the Clayton and FTC Acts. The two new laws were complementary to each other and supplementary to the Sherman Act, which remained foundational. And by their explicit terms, these laws focused on competition. The Clayton Act outlaw outlawed four specific types of business practices when they threatened a substantial lessening of competition, including certain types of mergers and sitting on boards of competitors. The FTC Act established the agency to study and stop unfair methods of competition. Over time, Congress has continued to update these laws. Since the passage of the Sherman FTC and Clayton Acts, the substance of antitrust law has adapted to changes in our economy and improvements in our understanding of the competitive process gained from the study of economics and business alike. Insights from the Chicago and Harvard schools of the 1960s and 70s, for example, brought greater sophistication and rigor to the antitrust enterprise. They moved beyond crude inferences based on market structure and concentration to a more detailed examination of how particular conduct could harm competition and consumers in specific markets. Judges could now better identify and condemn anti-competitive behavior without also punishing business practices that fostered competition and benefited consumers. They realized that antitrust law had gone too far in condemning certain conduct that could be pro-competitive and therefore deserved a more searching review of its harms and benefits, the rule of reason. As a result, the law changed for the better, becoming more coherent and less likely to undermine that which was always meant to protect, competition. So today, Americans enjoy the fruits of half a century of exceptionally strong economic growth and innovation. 
many factors, most of which lie outside the topic of this lecture and way above my pay grade, fueled this. But also deserving of credit, sensible, competition-oriented antitrust enforcement. In the main, the American capitalist economic model has been a success. The United States, with less than 5% of the world's population, prides itself on having the world's largest economy. That is good for American consumers, workers, businesses, and investors. That makes protecting the competitive processes that have fostered the American economy, industries, ingenuity, and innovation, an economic imperative. Antitrust works as a tool for protecting competition. When used to vindicate non-competition goals, at best it is an imperfect tool, at worst a dangerous one. The populist politics of antitrust today, including the administration and a network of politicians, activists, pundits, and companies that find it easier and cheaper to aim the government at their competitors, is repurposing antitrust away from competition. A few examples. First, President Biden's re recent executive order on promoting competition in the American economy. The EO includes some measures that would stoke competition, like calling for action on overly restrictive occupational licensing requirements. That is an area on which the commission has done a lot of good in the past, and I hope we continue that tradition. But too much, too much of the EO is inconsistent with competition. It seeks to impose regulation upon regulation in sector upon sector, often with a dubious legal basis, and call it competition. While regulation can encourage competition, often it can have the opposite effect. Regulatory barriers to entry are a recurring feature of antitrust complaints filed by my agency, the FTC. Second, too often concerns about large technology companies, or really just technology, are cast as failures of antitrust with next to no critical consideration. Both the political left and right are guilty of this. Take privacy. Democrats in Congress and elsewhere tell us that if we had more competitors and say social media, we would have better privacy. It might very well be that more competitors will lead to greater privacy for consumers. That's plausible. But the profit motive here? That is, most digital platforms generate revenue by monetizing user data to sell ads, hardly dictates that outcome. It's not intuitive. And in more cases, increased privacy could, and in fact does, limit the ability of firms to compete and leave consumers with a worse product or service. Or take content moderation. Republicans often argue that if there were better competition, conservatives would be subject to less censorship online. How to moderate content at scale is a really difficult problem, with most regulatory responses fraught with First Amendment peril. But is it a competition problem? People have a lot of issues with Twitter's moderation calls, but how exactly do they stem from monopoly power? And why does anyone think that were Facebook to sell Instagram and WhatsApp, conservatives would get more favorable treatment? The fact is that we have little social consensus about what level of moderation of speech is optimal. So why anyone assumes that a market functioning without whatever impediment they perceive would yield their desired moderation outcome is not clear to me. Third, the sheer reach of the claims of antitrust reformers about what the law could or would solve suggests that their concerns are not about competition. Would-be reformers have been quick to blame antitrust enforcement, or lack thereof, for everything from supply chain issues for medical devices during COVID-19, to labor gaining too little from, the American, from American economic growth, to systemic racism, and even the decline of American democracy. The point is not that privacy or content moderation or, or all of these issues do not warrant conversation. They surely do. But it is not at all clear, to, at least to me, that these are issues that stem from competition problems. And so, among other things, it seems counterintuitive that competition solutions will solve them. Protecting competition can sometimes serve non-competition goals, but even healthy competition does not always guarantee, for example, cleaner air or fairer wages. That is precisely why we have environmental regulation and labor laws. Preserving competition does a great job of, well, preserving competition. It does not guarantee everything you might want, and that is okay. 
and it is consistent with what the antitrust laws are designed to do. Fan though I am of officially, uh, efficiently operating markets, even perfect competition cannot solve every ill in our society. Fourth, some pending legislative proposals bar competition. That is their purpose and effect. They would prevent certain companies from expanding into new businesses, that is, from introducing new competition. Finally, a particular cohort of antitrust reformers seek to defend cartels, which we call the supreme evil of antitrust. Preoccupied with, supposed, with the supposed power of big companies, they bemoan government enforcement against cartels of small producers and endorse enthusiastically attempts to enable cartel behavior by what they view as more sympathetic companies, for example, the news media. Whatever these proposals are about, it's not competition. So why is so much debate focused upon antitrust? One reason I submit is the belief by some that many social ills, Ills stem from this, that, or all large corporations. Antitrust is a historically resonant way in which the government goes after such companies. But it is not, and never was, a sort of general warrant that permits the government to punish a company for being unpopular or even bad in whatever way. Nor does antitrust exist to equalize any power imbalances that someone might perceive. Another reason, I think, is that the vernacular of antitrust resonates with the public as a means of addressing problems associated with corporations and does so in a way that is much more comfortable <coughs> to American ears than, say, industrial planning or even regulation. It seems like once a week, when some politician expressing displeasure about one tech giant or the other, doing one thing or another, professes exasperation and says, break them up. What precisely is that supposed to solve? It, breaking up companies is part of antitrust enforcement. I vote for it sometimes, in particular with respect to mergers. But breakups are billed popularly as a kind of ultimate punishment for companies that have done wrong, a sort of corporate death penalty. But antitrust is not a morality play. And divestitures are not about punishing the wicked or bringing low the mighty. They are, rather, an intervention to remedy specific competition harms and leave consumers better off. That's it. There are also risks to using antitrust as a cudgel and pouring too much into the vessel of antitrust. Forcing antitrust enforcers to pick and choose between non-competition goals will politicize antitrust enforcement render it vulnerable to political influence. This has happened before. The Watergate tapes famously exposed Nixon's interference on behalf of, the RNC, of an RNC donor in a Department of Justice antitrust case. This was ITT. The scandal led Congress to require a federal judge to approve every settlement by the Justice Department. We don't have that at FTC, but they do. The Nixon administration also reportedly threatened television networks with antitrust suits to extract positive press coverage. Populist antitrust is also less likely to be effective, which will ultimately hurt consumers. Without a focus on competition, we will ignore harms to consumers. At the FTC, I have considered cases where lessening competition might protect the environment better or keep kids from vaping. The Arch Cole case, the Jewel case, these are worthy goals, but they are not what antitrust protects. And looking past competition into other matters would harm consumers. The reflexive resort to competition themes will lead us and other policymakers to get basic facts wrong, leading to formulating bad policy. Recently, the chair of my agency responded to a White House concern about rising gas prices with a claim that gas station mergers were the cause because some involve purchases of family-run businesses or something about power imbalances between large chains and little guys. There are a number of drivers for rising prices at the pump, but nothing I am aware of suggests that mergers are the culprit. At a time when gas prices are at a seven-year high, Americans can ill afford policy to be fashioned on such thin gruel. A few months ago, a friend of mine, kind of a, an arch-conservative guy, asked me a question over drinks. Why shouldn't we break up the big tech companies? Being Jewish, I answered the question with a question. What would that solve? <laughs> he replied, oh, nothing. I just want to stick it to him. <laughs> there are important questions, competition questions worth asking 
including especially about the digital economy. But too much of the discussion boils down to that point that my friend made. We don't like them or something that they're doing or merely exemplify. And antitrust is a tool to use to punish them. But antitrust is not and has never been a general warrant to punish companies that some or even many don't like. No more so than the other myriad legal regimes that we have here in America. Antitrust is about competition and it should stay that way. Thank you. Are we sitting down? I, I believe we are sitting down. All right. Take, take your pick. <clears throat> I will ask a, a long first question to give you a chance to, to have some water. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll ask two or three questions, and, and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience. Um, first question is, is, is about democracy. And, and, and I ask this because um, you said you started off in political theory here at Dartmouth. And also, I, I feel like there's sort of a, a view about the nature of democratic practice implicit in your talk, and I want to try to draw it out a little bit. So, so you said we really shouldn't, quote, politicize antitrust enforcement. And, and it strikes me that the, the view of democracy sort of implicit in this talk is, 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 is highly legalistic, but it's also highly idealistic in, in the following sense. Law is law, politics is politics, and, and, and they should be separate spheres. So, so say somebody on, on the other side um, was wondering the, the, the following, which is, do you object to sort of a particular method of doing politics or the substance of, of that use? Which, which is to say, a bunch of people want to regulate big tech. A bunch of people really hate big tech. Um, they can't go through the courts. They can't go through Congress. And the natural next move, thinking strategically, and, and, and lots of political actors do this, is, well, let's try to do it in regulatory agencies. The way we're doing it might be legally sketchy. It might be in conflict with traditions and norms. But it's our best strategic shot, given that the other uh, sort of you know, avenues on the game tree are foreclosed. And this is just a normal way of doing politics. This is a normal method of democratic practice. You seem to, to, to not be a fan of that view. So I think that's fundamentally true. Let, let me share an anecdote about the, the kind of philosophical question, the approach to law. Um, I'm going to meander a little on this one, so I beg, the, uh, I beg the forgiveness of the audience. And then let me come back to the big tech question. So when I was in law school, it was like the day before um, Thanksgiving or something, we watched a video of Herb Wachtel, who's like a really famous litigator arguing a case, this was my corporations class, in front of the Delaware Court of, no, I guess it was the Delaware Supreme Court. And so Delo, the Delaware law for, for the students in particular is basically the most important corporate law in America. And most public companies, at least, are, are incorporated in Delaware. And there was a, a classmate of mine um, who asked the professor after we watched this video of Herb Wachtell arguing, why is he talking about policy? Why isn't he talking about law? And the professor kind of stopped, and he looked around the room. And for purposes of the story, it's important to understand I did not attend Yale Law School. <laughs> and he kind of looked at the class, and he was like, you guys don't get it. And we were like, what? What don't we get? He said, law and policy are just two parts of the same thing. You don't believe that. And he was sort of directing this at the whole class. He's like, we all get it on the faculty. And the, 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 like, the TA raises his hand, and he said, is that maybe because you all went to the law school in New Haven? <laughs> um, and the professor responded, no, it's like you guys just didn't get the message. To which I then replied, this is a true story. I said, well, we got the message from Yale. It came in a small envelope. That's why we're here. <laughs> um, I think that dichotomy that this professor, a guy named Mike Klausner, was drawing is exactly the same question you're asking. Um, my view is that in a Republican form of government where the rule of law applies, the way we make societal decisions is mediated through things like Congress and the courts, and to be clear, also agencies, which have the power that Congress gives them. Um, I don't view the power of one as expanding because the, like, the other is doing less. I think you still have to go through 
all of those things. Which gets me to the big tech question. So there is broad consensus in Congress. <clears throat> and to be clear, I agree with the proposition I'm about to make, that on some level we need to rein in big tech. This is like a phrase you will hear all the time. But to do what? Right? What is the problem we're solving? How do we want to rein them in? And there I submit there's actually quite a bit less consensus. And my view of my job is not to be responsive to like an urge that Congress has or that members of Congress has or even the polls well. It's you express your view through legislation or really the appropriations process is a great way if you're in Congress to get things done. Um, but you, you do laws, that's how you do your thing. Um, and my job is to enforce those laws. And so I think maybe I just don't agree with the premise that because this guy over here says he wants to do something but isn't doing it, the lady over there, she's going to do more than she's supposed to do. Perfect. A question about Congress then, stepping back a bit and to an earlier part of your career. Um, so you were a chief counsel to one of the sharpest members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, so we're going to play a short game of uh, best and worst. Uh oh. Um, famously, that committee holds Supreme Court confirmation hearings. What was one or what were one or two of the, the best moments you witnessed at Supreme Court confirmation hearings? And one or two of the worst moments that you witnessed during Supreme Court confirmation hearings? So I was only there for one Supreme Court nomination process, which was the nomination and ultimately confirmation of Neil Gorsuch to be on the Supreme Court. Um, Best and worst. My favorite part, oh gosh, it's hard to say. I, the Gorsuch hearings were not that, can I say this, interesting? Like they were, they were actually not that, especially in light of subsequent hearings, they were not particularly memorable. Um, but I think the best part was getting to see how a lot of the different senators chose, like what issues they chose to focus upon. I'm gonna, I'm gonna coo a little about my old boss, but I love that he focused on access to justice issues. Right? Federal courts are expensive. They're an important tool in our democracy. They're really expensive to use. Um, and Justice Gorsuch seemed to be kind of caught off guard because he really did agree with that, but it wasn't the kind of question he was expecting. So that was kind of a nice moment. Um, I always worry about talking about worst moments that I will tend toward the ad hominem, so maybe I should shy away from that. That's, that's fair. My next question is about Senator Josh Hawley. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> that makes sense to eight of you. Um, my next question is actually, uh, and, and then I'll turn it over to the audience, is about um, the non-delegation doctrine. Maybe a, a bit of a, a, an easier question to answer. So. Um, Tell us what the, the non-delegation doctrine is, what the Supreme Court might do to it, and how it might change the very nature of American governance, including for your agency. A light topic. Yes. Okay, so um, I didn't plan this. I just want everybody to know this is important. <laughs> uh, this was Professor, Professor Nackles's idea. So the non-delegation is this idea that kind of starts appearing pretty early in Supreme Court decisions like in, in, in the age of the Republic, I think as early as you know, the 18th century, um, that there is a limit to what Congress can give others to do when it comes to legislation. They can't just give away their legislative authority. And this comes up in, it's, it's sort of discussed in cases, but it doesn't ever matter or it doesn't actually matter until the New Deal in two very famous cases, um, Panama Refining and, and Schechter Poultry. And in those cases, the Supreme Court invalidates the National Industrial Recovery Act, which at that point is like the signature feature of the New Deal. And the specific portion at issue in Schechter Poultry, which is like the godfather case, is a provision that allowed the the president, President Roosevelt, to declare codes of fair competition. And what the court said was like, no, you can't just tell all these businesses what to do. That's too much power. Congress can't just let you, they have to be on some level more specific or directional or what have you. 
And since then, like before, people have continued to talk about the non-delegation doctrine, but it hasn't ever decided a case. Why is this interesting? Why are we talking about? There are sort of, the, I'll get to the big answer in a minute, but basically judges are beginning to talk about non-delegation again, and notably Justice Gorsuch in his dissent in the Gundy case, which garnered three votes. Um, and then there was a concurrence from Justice Alito, which basically suggested, well, I'm, I'm interested in reviving the non-delegation doctrine, but not in this case. And then um, Justice Kavanaugh in the Paul case wrote a, a short statement basically saying like, yeah, I'm with that. So there's some suggestion that five members of the court at least are interested in exploring this limit to how much power Congress can give agencies effectively to legislate. It's relevant to what I do for the following reason. In 1915, the FTC Act, or in 1914, the FTC Act was passed, and there's a line in Section 6G that says something to the effect of like, which 6G is about how we, Section 6 broadly is how we investigate corporations because we're kind of like a think tank. Section 6G is how we organize them, and there's a line that says, and something to the effect of you have authority to issue regulations like to effectuate your jurisdiction or something like that. I'm, I'm getting the wording wrong. The substance of the statute, oh sorry, for 50 years the FTC believed this only gave it power to like make rules for itself. How do we run our administrative court? How do we handle subpoenas? This kind of thing. But in the 60s, the FTC discovered that its view was that this also meant substantive regulation. Not only can we tell ourselves how to operate, we can tell firms in the market how to behave. And if they don't go along, we can penalize them. So the FTC sort of discovers this power. And in 1972, it is blessed by a federal court. Now, not just any federal court. It's blessed by the DC Circuit. I told you I was going to meander on this one. Um, and in particular, two of the three judges on the panel are Judges Skelly Wright and um, uh, uh, Bazelon, who are kind of very 1970s activist judges who had a view that like, we should read in as much as possible regulatory authority for agencies. And the case goes in favor of the FTC. A few years later, Congress intervenes and does some things uh, to the FTC's regulatory power on the consumer protection side, but leaves like explicitly in statute punts on the question of antitrust regulation. Do we have the power to issue these? The new chair um, and the other sitting Democrat have expressed their view that we can make these regulations, these antitrust regulations, and I think that's going to happen. They don't have the votes right now, but I think it's going to happen. And the reason I think it's relevant to the delegation discussion is what the court invalidated in Schechter Poultry was codes of fair competition. Our statute says unfair methods of competition. That's the same thing, or at least the converse. There's absolutely no limit, right? All you have to do is say competition, and competition applies to quite a few things. In particular, I was talking a moment ago about the broad view that a lot of people take about competition. Whatever you thought about it, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, well, in terms of how the courts speak today, the more capacious your view, the more capacious unfair methods of competition is, the fewer limits on the FTC's power. I think that may be a delegation problem. I think there are questions about the statutory authority. Happy to belabor those much later. But I think we are walking into courts that are not so sure. So where does this leave us? I don't know the answer to that. Some people believe that if you were to reinvigorate non-delegation, you would essentially end the power of the administrative state. I'm not actually sure that's true. There is a, I'm gonna really geek out here, I'm sorry. There's a wonderful article from 2002 um, by a guy named Thomas Merrill who teaches now at Columbia Law School where he teases out what he believes is a drafting convention. That for decades, when Congress wanted to say, you don't just have power to like run your agency, but you have power to make regulations to run the world, they would give you penalty authority, right? It would mean something. You could slap someone down. Um, but Congress, when it wasn't interested in doing that, wouldn't include those words. 
Um, so that's a line the court could draw. The court could draw no lines at all. They could uphold um, what the DC Circuit found in uh, National Petroleum Refiners was the Skelly Wright case. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but it's very clear that the justices are interested in getting back into the non-delegation business. How far they'll go, what they cut, I think remains to be seen. Um, but it could have a real impact on at least what we understand today or what the agencies understand today is their regulatory power. Thanks. Let's get to- That uh, went way too long, I'm sorry about no, that. that but we've gotta to get to Facebook and Amazon. So, your questions. Um, if you raise your hand, I will call on folks. I believe there is a microphone, but if not, just yeah. yell. Great, there's a microphone. Um, so questions, and we'll take some student questions first. And I will sit here as long as it takes for two students to raise their hand. He will make me sit here as long as it takes. So that's the real. Maya. Uh, what do you think is the most. Oh, could you hang on for the microphone? Thanks. Is it on? Okay. What do you think is the most likely outcome of these Senate hearings on big tech and like this drive that both parties have to somehow regulate? Um, when it comes to Congress, the most likely outcome is often nothing, <laughs> uh, statistically speaking. The, I think it's plausible we get an antitrust bill, like some sort of change in the liability standards. I'm not sure which one it's gonna be, like it could be a merger bill, it could be a bill about if you have a platform, sort of a non-discrimination regime, um, there's a bunch of different ideas that people talk about. Um, I think money for the agencies is likely to come. Uh, that's been coming in the last few years, but I think there'll be sort of more. Um, privacy is kind of a perennial at this point. The legislators um, are very close on liability and further apart on like remedy questions. Like should we have a preemptive law for America or allow the state laws? Should we allow private lawsuits or just give it to the federal and state enforcers? Those are, actual, those are important questions to be sure. They're, not, they're easier to solve um, the, the, than like the liability questions and that's actually where they're closest together. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I probably should never have predicted anything because having worked in Congress, it's hard to predict exactly what will come. I do think, and we were talking about this earlier at dinner tonight, there is a dynamic where to some extent we'll see changes before laws change. We'll see behavior changes in response to public opinion. Um, we'll see changes in response to foreign laws. We'll see changes in response to litigation. Um, the App Store is like a really interesting thing to follow and how, and in particular, the Apple App Store has been the principal. Uh, they sort of had their trial first. I think there's a trial coming in Google. Um, those are interesting questions too about how you regulate, uh, whether you regulate App Stores. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, but I don't think that public attention to, concern about, large tech companies going anywhere. That is like a, that is here for a while. And on some level it should be, right? Uh, their technology is changing how people live and it's changing how businesses work and part of that is really disruptive. Um, to some extent there's good disruption and to some extent there's bad disruption, but it is disruptive. And so it's not shocking at all. Like we saw in Thurlow Gordon's time, both his youth and sort of his early professional years, um, that when there are changes in the economy um, that you see a lot of popular and, and congressional attention. Professor Muirhead. Would a um, competition-oriented FTC, would it be right to imagine that, that uh, an FTC like that might go after uh, non-compete uh, uh, agreements that, that employers force employers, employees to sign rather than having to wait for legislation to deal with that? So, um, 
Non-competes was something we began to explore at workshops a few years ago in 2019. This is actually when I started talking about the non-delegation doctrine because one idea is to try to make a rule about non-compete agreements mm. to have the FTC do it. This is sort of the earliest proposal for how to use the rulemaking power. But leaving that question aside, whether we have that power, whether if we do is constitutional, um, I do think non-competes are an area that like requires attention. So I kind of view them as part of a broader thing that we've seen for a long time in America, which is nobody moves, right? You can fly more cheaply. You can talk to your family abroad for zero. Like you don't have to pay. You can see your kids' faces to wish them good night um, from across the country. So the cost of being far from your loved ones has gone down dramatically, but people don't move as much. And I think there are a number of factors. There's a great, art, I'm just like citing articles, but like David Schleicher's article, he's at Yale, called Stuck. But some of the factors have to do, I think, with impediments to switching jobs. So I mentioned occupational licensing requirements. That implicates people's ability to start a new business. Non-competes implicate your ability to go and get another job in, in a similar industry. And we are, you know, there are a lot of interesting studies that have come out about how prolific non-competes are. Um, there are rationales for non-compete agreements. Um, in particular, you know, the protection of training and, and trade secrets and that sort of thing. But when you see like burger flippers with non-compete agreements, um, you worry, you know, maybe it's malice, maybe it's just eager beaver labor lawyers and nobody ever noticed, but a lot of people in America can't go do a similar thing. And the efficiency justification is hard to see. Um, no poach agreements have been another uh, point of interest in particular for the Justice Department because that is criminal. When you, you and I agree not to hire Maya, um, we wouldn't do that. Um, so I think that non-compete agreements are an area that requires additional focus, um, without a doubt. Um, and you know, if we see something that violates the law, like we should go after it. There was a case in Washington that the state AG brought. I can't remember the defendant. Um, it was settled, but um, yeah, I mean, I personally would like to see more cases like that. I'm curious, how do you interpret the HHI and how do you and the other commissioners, how much emphasis do you actually put on it? Because it seems like those of us in the outside world, when we look at a high HHI versus a low one, that's something that we pay a huge amount of attention to and think in the way that you guys will maybe think about cases. And as a corollary to that, how do you think about the cases where they try to make a different argument for what the market or product is in the same broader, you know, I think you brought up the Arch Cole Peabody case, and that's sort of what I'm thinking about in those terms. Sure. So, um, I mean, I think HHIs matter. HHIs are like ways that we measure the level of concentration in a defined market. Actually, let me, let me talk to the second point first. An HHI doesn't mean anything if you're not in the right market. Like, you have to get to the market before you figure out how concentrated it is. There's always going to be disputes about what the market is. Um, but, you know, we look at a lot of deals, we bring a lot of cases, judges make decisions. Um, I thought that Judge Pitlick, that was her first civil case. She was, I think, 39. Um, one of the best antitrust decisions I've read in years. Absolutely, that, and that was a hard case because we're out there arguing, oh, sorry, let me back up. Um, earlier I referred to a case about um, environment, like that might be bad for the environment for us to break. The Arch Coal case is, was a joint venture, but essentially a merger of two coal mines in the Southern Powder River Basin, which is sort of the best coal, the most economically extracted coal, which fuels power plants in America. There is a long-term trend in America, which I think most people regard as really good, which is that we are moving off coal mostly to natural gas. Natural gas is still a hydrocarbon, but it burns a heck of a lot cheaper than even the cleanest coal. Um, however, uh, and the position the parties took in litigation was, we can't raise prices, and this was essentially a merger to monopoly. We can't raise prices because if we do, there will be an, accelerated, an acceleration of this trend. 
from coal burning plants to natural gas. And the position we took was maybe, but a lot of these coal plants are still gonna be around for a while. Like that's a very expensive move. Um, there was some economist on like Twitter or whatever who quipped that like, don't we want coal monopolies? Right, we want coal to be more expensive so that we can accelerate the trend and reduce carbon emissions. And to be clear, like as sort of an abstract social matter, that might very well be right. But that's not what we're protecting. Like we have environmental laws to deal with that. What we're supposed to be protecting, this was like a you know, unanimous case, everyone agreed on this. Even though we might want more natural gas and less coal in some other general way, this was going to hurt consumers. <coughs> Okay, HHI, sorry. So um, they matter for the law. That's the Philadelphia National Bank case from the 60s. They matter under the merger guidelines. Uh, there has been a lot of talk, including from the agency heads about, and in the executive order that I mentioned, about revisiting the horizontal merger guidelines. Um, there are some people out there in the jabbertariat something, people who talk, who want to bring back the levels from the 68 guidelines, like dramatically reduce the level of concentration that would be presumed liability. I don't think there's good data to support that, um, but that's probably, a, you know, coming attractions at this point. My uh, question is a little bit different and um, kind of specifically concerns sort of intellectual property law. Um, I was just kind of wondering, um, sort of, would you say that intellectual property protections, that is patent laws, copyrights, et cetera, stimulate innovation? Or would you say that more often than not, intellectual property law stifles innovation by allowing larger players to sue smaller competitors based upon claims of IP infringement of one sort or another? Okay, this is a great question. And actually it's a like even earlier historically resonant question. So the link between IP and antitrust is almost ancient at this point. Um, so, oh gosh, my history is probably not good enough here, but well before the founding of our republic, the British were pretty incensed at the way that the king handed out um, monopolies. So monopolies used to be government grants of power. The king would hand out monopolies to favored people. And sometimes they had a sort of beneficial thing. You want the glass blower from Venice to come up and live in London and the weather sucks. So you're gonna give him a monopoly on glass blowing. So he's gonna get rich, um, but you'll have glass blowing in London in a way that you didn't before. But this really pissed a lot of people off. And so they adopted something called the law of monopolies. And the founders of the American Republic were very well aware of this. Um, they did not like monopolies. And to be clear, the monopolies they were talking about aren't monopolies like we say today. These are government grants of power. And they were issued with what? Letters patent. Literally, a letter patent is a monopoly grant. So there's obviously a limitation to competition involved. Um, what the founders said was, we can have these things but they need to be to promote, the, I forget the language in the Constitution, promote the progress of science and the useful art, something to that effect. And that's copyright and patent and trademark RIP laws. Um, my view is that they mostly incentivize competition. Um, clearly in the immediate, the point is to protect one person's IP and keep others out. And, and so to limit competition, but you create a rent and that rent induces competition. Um, can they be abused? Sure. Can they be used legally in ways that probably in some particular instance are not net good? Sure. Can big guys use it to keep out small guys? 100%. But I think in the main, the IP system, and, and to be clear, the IP system probably deserves some tweaks, um, but I think in the main it has been helpful for innovation. But let me say the following. I think the IP laws have been on some level pretty strong for a while, and we've seen a lot of innovation at the same time. Um, they've been, for a variety of reasons, weakened a little in recent years, in particular the Supreme Court's eBay versus Merck exchange decision about when you can get an injunction. Um, but I think in the main what we've seen is a trend that shows that these are consistent with innovation, like on average over time. 
we've got a few minutes left. I'm gonna ask a very quick final question. What will Facebook and Amazon look like 20 from years, 25 years from now, given what you've said tonight? I mean, I think the right answer is if I knew, I would be, well, I can't trade on it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's really hard to tell. Um, you know, we'll see. <laughs> I'll, I'll say the following, right? So it was 1998, and Klein gave a speech. She gave a speech in Rocky too. We, Where's Joanne? Joanne found this out. Thank you, Joanne. Um, and Microsoft was a monopolist in OS, in operating systems. On some level, Microsoft is still a monopolist in operating systems, right? I, the difference is, in this context, that operating systems don't matter as much as they used to, right? Or desktop, you know operating systems and laptop operating systems don't matter as much as they used to. And that's been the change. It hasn't been that like Microsoft was unseated. And by the way, Microsoft, what's its valuation today? It's like $2 trillion. I mean, it's the second largest by market cap of any of these companies or something like that. Depends on the day, I suppose. So what changed wasn't that Microsoft was unseated. It's that the seat on which it sat just didn't matter as much um, because Technology moved on and, and sort of society moved on. And, you know, Microsoft is still doing great, but um, there are other firms on which people now are focused. Please join me again in thanking Commissioner Nell Phillips. Thank you. Thank you.